Our God and our Father, we bless your name for this day. We bless you because of the Bible, the word you have given us to study, so that your thoughts, your words, will influence and affect our lives. You are wise, we are foolish. You know all things, we know nothing. And we cannot direct our lives by ourselves except by the study of your word. And the great work you have given us to do in the single life we have to live is so great and requires so much that without your teaching us as to what to do, how to do it, we will not be able to successfully carry out your will. And so we're asking that today you will speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. And what you tell us will become within us such great power and light that all that we lay our hands upon for the glory of your name will succeed in Jesus' name. Amen. Lead us by your spirit into the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have been studying the lives and the ministries of Paul and Barnabas, especially at this time that we're looking at their first missionary journey. And I've told you that these things we study will not necessarily make us apostles, or pastors, or evangelists, or teachers, or prophets. But the things we study will make us effective in whatever area of the work the Lord wants us to be involved in. And I've told you that many people have gone through these passages we're studying. Just to look at the first missionary journey and see that Paul and Barnabas went this way, went that way, and they did this, they did that without getting much out of what they read. But we are going so slowly in looking at all these things that we're studying so that we can get something for our lives and for the ministry that God has given every one of us. In this chapter, we're looking at the qualifications for effective service. When you look at those who are serving the Lord today in various capacities, you find there are different levels of effectiveness. And then as you check up their lives, you find that it may not be because they are not consecrated or committed to the Lord. It may not be because they are not even spiritually qualified. You know what I mean? Having the spiritual qualities of a real Christian, real born-again believer, or the qualities of a man that ought to be involved in the work of the Lord. They may have those qualities. But then the qualifications for effective service they may not really have. It's just like you look at two people who have been to school. They are in business now. Looking at education, they have apparently the same level of education. Apparently. When you tell them to show their certificates, they have the same certificates to show. And if they're in business, perhaps they have the same capital to start with. And yet, down the line, after some years, you find that one of them is successful, the other one is not. Come back to the church. You'll find there are people that have sound testimonies of the encounter or the experience with the Lord. And as to their access to the Holy Ghost, by and large, they have some testimony that they have been filled with the Spirit. And yet when you look at the work they are doing, either as pastors or as evangelists, or the increasing work in one way or the other, you see that things are totally different. The results are not the same. And you begin to wonder why. Well, let's look at First Timothy to start with. Chapter 3, from verse 1. These are just basic qualifications. The mistake on the part of the church has been, if a Christian worker, a bishop, an elder, a pastor, a teacher, if a Christian worker has uh, these qualifications, then he'll be successful in the work of the Lord. Well, these qualifications you read about here are the very foundation stones you find in his life. But it depends on what he builds upon the foundation. 
if he doesn't have these qualifications we're reading about in First Timothy chapter 3, the New Testament says it's not even a candidate for consideration. You don't even consider him at all for the Christian world. But if he has these qualifications, then it's getting started. And then as you look into the Acts of the Apostles and you see what we're seeing in the lives of Barnabas and Paul, you begin to see how actually to succeed in the world. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, that just means a presbyter, an elder, a Christian worker, a preacher. He desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. That means a bishop must live a holy life. Husband or one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy looker, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, less being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now what you read about here pertains to the heart condition, the life, or if you like, the fruit of the spirit. This man is a man that has love, love for men, hospitality. He has the love of God within him that makes him not to want to hurt anybody because if you love, you are not going to do evil to anybody, therefore he's blameless. And he's a person that is of good behavior, easy to live with, easy to go along with. And he's a person that is apt to teach. The desire is there. The inclination is there. He's not given to wine, he has temperance, he has self-control. Is no striker, is a man of peace. You know, the love of God is there, the joy of the Lord is there, the peace of God is there, the gentleness is there. And then he's not a person that is, uh, you know, disorganized in his house, he's a real father. He's a person that leads a family life very well. And the children are submissive to him. Because they see the love of God in his life. And he's able to control the family in the love of God. He is not a novice. And the fruit of the spirits are ripened and well developed. Then he has a good report outside. Now, there are people that read this. And they feel, well, I thank God I'm born again. I thank God the Lord has made me holy in my life. I'm ready for Christian service. But wait a minute. As you read other parts of the Bible, you have what the Bible calls the gifts of the Spirit. And many people just settle at the fruit of the Spirit. And they feel that now everything is okay, they are alright, they can go ahead and get the work done. Yes, you are a candidate for consideration. When these things are in your life, you desire the office of a bishop, you desire the office of a preacher, and the fruit of the Spirit is in your life, you are a candidate for consideration. The same thing we're told in Titus chapter 1. Reading from verse 6 of verse 5. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Now, who was Titus to appoint or ordain? Who are the people to be considered as candidates for the service of the Lord in the church? Verse 6, if any be blameless, fruit of the Spirit, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless, as a steward of God, not self-willed, not stubborn, 
talking about the condition of the heart, the attitude, the actions of his life, his behavior. Not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, that is, is not covetous. But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, is consistent on Bible doctrine, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, as I've told you, these qualities of life are very, very important. And yet, the qualities that we have read about, that we have read now in our lives, do not fit us into every aspect of the work of God. As you come into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with them. Now you have these candidates that they are going into Christian service. And now the Apostle Paul, who wrote what we read in Timothy and what we read in Titus, now he's writing in 1 Corinthians and he's saying, You've got the fruit, you are blameless, you are holy. There's no covetousness. There's the love of God within you and love for men within you. You're hospitable. You're apt to teach. The desire to minister and to teach is there. Now don't forget this, that there is what is called the manifestation of the Spirit. And it's given to every man to profit with her. You want to profit in the service of the Lord? You want to really qualify to get the work done. Verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom. That's already going beyond them, um, you know, just good behavior. You know, many people who are well behaved and they do not have much wisdom. Well behaved, no covetousness. They love, they love the work of God, they love people, they love God, but wisdom. And then it says to another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit, to another, faith. By the same spirit. I'm sure you know there are people that are well behaved. They don't have covetousness. They are greedy or filthy looker. They are no striker. You know they, they are given to hospitality. But they do, not, they do not have the faith that moves the mountain. They do not have the faith that will be able to go through thick and thin. Whatever it is. The opposition, the persecution, the difficulty, the resistance in society. They do not have the faith that will, that will make a way in the wilderness or in the forest. Yet, when you consider the fruit of the Spirit, when you consider their faithfulness, you consider their honesty, you consider their love, the joy, the peace, the gentleness, the long-suffering, the self-control, they have all that. But if you are going to succeed in the work of the Lord, you need much faith in God. Faith to move mountains. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But all these workers, that one and the self same Spirit, Dividing to every man severally as he will. I read all that to you to tell you this, that in Christian work, it is true that a holy life is very, very important. Very, very important. In fact, you know, if you are living a doubtful, dubious life, you are not even qualified to be considered at all. But as important as holy living is, to be successful in the work of the Lord, we need some other qualifications. That will actually make us to do significant work for the Lord. You know, many, many years ago, a number of us, young, young people, all we knew was holiness unto the Lord. 
Oh, and we said without holiness no man shall see the Lord. You know that is true. And it is still true. But you know that's for every believer. That's the life of the believer. But when you come into the ministry and you're going to minister, you better understand that holiness is important, but you need much more than holiness. You need faith to move mountains. You need uh, what we studied last week. We studied about the boldness. I know people who are holy, holy, no guilt, no condemnation for sin. But they do not have the boldness to go before either Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar or Herod or Pilate and say, Thus says the Lord. And you know, if you are going to work for the Lord and do it successfully, holiness is important. Good behavior is important. Being able to be, you know, a good family man, a good, uh, you know, family woman, that's very, very important. But the boldness that belongs specially to the Christian worker and then the wisdom. I showed you um, the other week about the wisdom of these apostles. They knew when to stay in a place and they knew the exact time to leave that place and go to another area of the world. And then power. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Now, that verse, uh, the Pentecostals, uh, you know, taking that verse, and you know, we say, when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you have power. You know, that's true. But you know, there was a day that uh, a friend of mine gave me the key to his car, and I didn't know how to drive. And the car did not do me any good at all because I couldn't move that car. I had the key in my hand, but I didn't know how to drive. You know the people that have power and they don't know how to use that power? They have the Holy Ghost. They speak in tongues. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. They have the key in their hand, but they have not learned how to drive. They have no license at all to use that power. You know you pity such people. But you know, if you are really going to work for the Lord, the power must be there and uh, the knowledge to use that power must also be there. And so, they had boldness, qualification of qualities for effective service. They had wisdom. They had power. And uh, we read last week what actually happened. How they saw that important man and Paul just looked at that man. And you know what he saw? You know, this is more than the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance, goodness, faith, I mean, fidelity. But you know, he saw that important man. And he was preaching and preaching. All of a sudden he stopped. And he looked straight at that man and he perceived he had faith to be healed, the sonning of spirits. He knew that the inner man within that crippled man had the faith to immediately jump up. And he said, man, rise on your feet. And the man leaped up and he walked. You know, a person can have all the fruit of the spirit and be nice, and be good, and well behaved, and be holy, and not have all that. And you know, if you are going to really do real Christian work, real Christian work, all these things are very, very important. And then, uh, as we go through the rest of the chapter, you will see the qualifications that were manifested in the lives of these apostles. Now, when that early man rose up, the heathens that were there, the pagans that were there, they thought that these were not human beings. They thought they were idols. And here comes the next quality in your life. Humility. Because as soon as you get into Christian service and you have boldness and you have wisdom and you have power, those three qualities alone will carry you very far. Boldness, wisdom, power, taking for granted you have already got all the other qualities you have the knowledge of the word of god because you are able to preach the word of god as you have been taught you have the basic foundational truths of the word of god on jesus saves and jesus heals and jesus delivers and jesus sanctifies and jesus baptizes in the holy ghost 
and you understand that there is only one name whereby we can be saved the name of Jesus Christ and together with that basic knowledge of the Bible you have the boldness the wisdom and the power that thing is going to carry you far and the next temptation is to be proud and that is the very next thing that came before them and confronted them the temptation or the tendency to be proud because of what the power of God had done in, in your life or the power of faith or the power of the Holy Ghost in your life now when the man arose up let's see the, the reaction of the pagans or the heathens that were there from verse 11 Acts chapter 14 when the people saw what Paul had done they lifted up their voices saying in the speech of the of Lyconia the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men and he called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker then the priest of Jupiter which was before their city brought oxen and gallants unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of they ran their clothes and ran in among the people crying out and saying sirs why do ye these things we also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein who in times past suffered or permitted all nations to walk in their own ways nevertheless he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling all hearts with food and gladness and with these sayings curse restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them the tendency for pride came in not in them no you know there are people that tell us that you know you have this corruption inside you all the time but no the corruption was not inside them the pride was not inside them but the tendency was there the situation was uh, you know about to bring that if they accepted it but they were not going to accept it because they knew all they did they did by the power of the holy ghost without the spirit of god in them they could do nothing and without the name of jesus to energize their prayer they could do nothing they realized that but these uh, barbarians and these uh, people they never knew anything better than their superstition or the idolatry of the past now here is where we ought to be careful in um, church administration there are times that um, the church may may have uh, wrong notions about a preacher you know for example if we sent out two people from this church and uh, they went to a village and with the power of God they minister to the people and uh, when they ministered to the people people got converted in a wonderful way or they got saved or they got um, you know healed in a miraculous way and the villagers there the people in the locality perhaps maybe they went to sacrifice uh, to do sacrifice unto them and the newspapers brought it out and they said well some two people they named them and we recognize them to be our members you know they went to this place and you know that day the people went around wanting to sacrifice to them you know if you are not careful the church is likely to be grumbling the church is likely to be saying oh they must have attracted attention to themselves they must have uh, you know influenced the people to worship them but you know you cannot be responsible for the actions of the pagans the superstitious people even when you've done all you could do and you have tried all you could just to project christ crucified and christ alone and that's what paul had done that's what barnabas had done and yet all these uh, superstitious people they, they just came around and they you know wanting to worship them to sacrifice unto them and if you are not careful you just say well we're not going to support those preachers anymore they are so proud they allow those people you know what paul did not understand their language 
because they were speaking the language of the, uh, the um, Lyconians. And they were saying, the gods have come, the gods have come. It wasn't the fault of Paul at all. It wasn't the fault of uh, Barnabas at all. And they didn't know in time. They just knew a miracle had happened and the people were shouting and the people were talking at the top of their voices. You know, maybe at the beginning they thought that they were just rejoicing because of the miraculous thing, that, the supernatural thing that happened. But um, already the priest was getting ready. They, they had gone to take the oxen that they were sacrificed and the gallants and everything before Paul and Barnabas started asking, what's the matter? What are they doing? What's happening? And then they told them that actually we, we know that you are not just human beings. We know that you are God and we want to sacrifice unto you. Then they became afraid. Then their actions showed that they didn't want anything like that. We learned a lesson from that. You know there are times that people come in here on Thursdays. And these people have never been in a church like this. And they see a wonderful, wonderful miracle that they had never seen before. And then perhaps they go to speak to other people. The language they use, we may not be there to correct them. And it may look like a language that smacks of pride, that, uh, that looks like pride. Like they are projecting, you know, a particular man. But you know the man you think they are projecting never knew what they are saying at all. If he knew, he would have rejected it. And you know, some people will go around and say, Oh, that uh, pastor is so proud. He's, uh, you know, influencing the people, teaching the people to be broadcasting his name about. No, sir, not at all. You know, Paul did not know at all. Barnabas did not know at all. You know, if we're not careful, all these uh, things will come in and, uh, you know, we'll say that man is proud, that man is proud. But you know, if you happen to be a minister, the time you understand that they are trying to exalt you above measure, that they are going beyond giving their testimony and giving the glory to God, the moment you know about it, you caution them. You stop them so that they can give all the glory to God. Now, they wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas. In fact, they were now calling them by the names of their idols, Jupiter and Mercurius. These are planets, but then they were calling them these names because uh, they thought that, uh, you know, these are our idols, they ought to worship. And he felt that these men were just these gods or these idols. Now, this was not the first time that some people who have been so shocked or surprised by the manifestation of the power of God will try to worship a man. But the men they worship, if they were men of God, they have always taught them. In uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 25 and verse 26. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And worshipped him. That wasn't Peter's fault. That was because of the ignorance of that man, Cornelius. Well, Cornelius was not a complete pagan. He had been praying. He had in fact seen an angel. And the angel had recommended Peter unto him. And now Peter came in. And you know what he did? He felt if this man was introduced to me by an angel, he must be a great, great, great man. And he fell down and he worshipped him. But in verse 26, Peter took him up, saying, Stand up. I myself also am a man. But please... Immaturity could set in. And if you were, you might say, Oh, I don't want them to worship me. And after you have corrected them, you say, Well, I'm not going to talk to you. Then you go back home. Oh, you say, I'm running away from pride. Uh-uh. That's immaturity. If they have a wrong attitude in wanting to worship you, correct the wrong attitude and go on and minister unto them. If they have a wrong attitude of bringing in pride, Elevating you above measure, correct that wrong attitude and go ahead and continue to minister to them. You know, Peter did not go back to Joppa where he came from and say, Well, Cornelius, because of that attitude, you fell down to worship me. I'm just a man like yourself. God will send another person. No, you'll be out of the will of God. You'll be out of the will of God. And you know, sometimes uh, somebody comes in here and uh, just before I give the message on Thursday, he's so excited. 
and he begins to give his testimony and the way he gives his testimony instead of mentioning christ or jesus christ or the lord of god who has given him the miracle perhaps he mentions the name of the preacher oh we feel bad about that because we want all the glory to go to god but you know it will be immaturity on my side to say well uh, already now the, that person mentioned my name and said i healed him instead of saying god healed him through the prayer of uh, the brother or whoever it is now to say well i will not preach anymore because you know they are saying that i did uh, i healed them i don't want to go to hell you can't go to hell on the basis of what the people are saying if you go to hell it will be on the basis of your own personal attitude internal attitude and so you see they continue to minister to them but they corrected the idolatry they corrected the uh, the pride or the worship and um, in first corinthians chapter 3 verses 6 and 7 i have planted apollos watered but god gave the increase this is what we are to realize every time that when the power of god is manifested is the lord giving the increase we pray if a miracle ever happens is god giving the increase we preach if souls ever get saved is god giving the increase I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither you see that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. That means, give all the glory to God. Give all the glory to God. Then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others. When we, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Now he said, um, we didn't seek glory of you, nor of any other set of people, group of people. Which means that on their own part. They were doing their best to keep humble under the mighty hand of God. They were doing their best to humble themselves before the Lord so that the power will continue with them. Now, that's one side of the story, but now the other side. There are assemblies and churches where they do not accept testimonies of healing at all. Well, they accept testimonies of salvation because, you know, nobody is ever going to say, uh, Pastor so-and-so saved me. But, you know, healing is different because Jesus said, as you go, preach the gospel. Then he says, heal the sick. He said, you do it. Heal the sick. He said, you do it, cleanse the lepers. He said, cast out devils. He said, raise the dead. Then he said, freely you have received, freely give. So you are giving something while you are ministering healing. So healing is a little bit different in the way of ministration than salvation. And so when people are healed, they know the person who has prayed. And there are various churches where they will not allow the testimony at all. They will just say, oh, well, God did it. But you know, the people are not going to say it that way. In fact, you know, when Peter and John go to the gate, a beautiful, he just said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give unto you. He knew he was doing it but by the power of the Lord. And you know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Verse 12. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience in signs and wonders and mighty deeds now he said all those things to tell them that he had those signs following his ministry and yet he will not accept worship there is a balance people give testimonies and it's right and it's necessary and it's um, Christianly, scriptural. They give all the glory to God, but then they appreciate that it has been done by either a prophet or an evangelist or a pastor or whoever it may be. And yet, all the glory is given to God because it's done in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, 
be humble. In whichever way the Lord is using you, be humble. They were humble and they discouraged the people that wanted to worship them. Now, let's go on. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, from verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. They had the power of God, and yet they faced persecution. In fact, do you know that the more successful you are in the work of the Lord, the more persecution you face? If you are a pastor of only 50 people in the congregation, you face a little persecution. When you become a pastor of 500 people in a congregation, you face more persecution. And when you become a pastor of um, 5,000 people in the congregation in the church, you'll be surprised the more successful you are, the more persecution you face. The more sinners are saved, the more devils are cast out, the more the devil becomes angry. And the more the people who are under the control and under the influence of the devil, the more they will be angry, the more persecution you will face. And you know some people that say, well, if deeper life is a church of the Lord, if deeper life is a ministry that God has raised up, everybody will agree with deeper life. Do you know the Bible at all? Moses was of God. And Pharaoh did not like him one single day. And those magicians in Egypt, they didn't speak well of him one single day. They were afraid of him. You know that Joshua was a really, a really appointed man of God. But the Canaanites were all running around planning strategy against Joshua. He was a great man of God. Have you, have you forgotten about David? The man after God sat. And he had more trouble than Samson. You know the people that are really chosen by God, selected by God, sent by God. They are the people that have a lot of trouble. But thank God, the hand of the omnipotent God is behind them. And the whole, the, the very throne of God is behind them. And the promises of God behind them. And the more the devil gets angry, the more God is smiling on the throne saying, Don't worry at all about it because that devil is not going to be able to hurt you at all, at all. They'll fight against you but they'll never overcome. You know when you are saved, you get a little persecution. Wait until you are sanctified. And when you are sanctified, you have more persecution. But wait until you are baptized in the Holy Ghost and that heavenly language begins to come out of your mouth. You'll be surprised. Even some members of the church who don't believe in the power of the Holy Ghost will begin to oppose you more than unbelievers. And when you begin to work for the Lord and people are getting saved and people are getting um, you know, healed and delivered, you wait until then and there will be more persecution than ever. You know, it, is, it has always been like that. You know, Jesus Christ, from the very time he was born, the Messiah, Christ, the Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, from the very time he was born, there are people who had never seen him, they were angry against him. Think about it. They just heard about the birth of Jesus Christ. They never saw him. They've never, he's never done evil to them at all. He's never even preached a single message. They were against him. And from the time he appeared, um, you know, river, at River Jordan, and he was baptized in water, and was shown publicly to those people, the devil was just after him, after him. And everywhere he went, synagogue or the street, at the seaside, or in the house, or mountainside, the enemies were always there. They were trailing him every time. You know, all those quiet years, the Sadducees did not, you know, trail him trail follow him but you know after he came out and he started casting out devils healing the sick preaching the sermon on the mount and giving them wonderful messages heaven sent messages it was at that time the persecution arose if you are in the church where there is no persecution at all and everybody in the community they are speaking good about that church i wonder what type of church you are but if it's a church that is causing trouble for Satan, if it's a church casting out devils, if it's a church healing the sick, 
If it's a church where sinners have been saved, if it's a church where lives have been changed, if it's a church spreading and growing, you hear there are converts there and converts there in the village, in the local government area, in the state, all over the nation, the devil is going to get angry. And those who are nearest to the devil are going to get really angry. You know, and sometimes uh, religious people are the nearest to the devil. Sometimes. And you know, some religious people are really angry when souls are saved. But thank God, he that is within the believer is greater than he that is outside there. You believe that? Yes. And you know, persecution arose for Paul and Barnabas. And then we're told that in verse 19, all these uh, Jews came from uh, Antioch and Iconium Jews, religious people religious people you know they were carrying the Old Testament and they saw they were defending the glory of God they saw that they were working for the Lord when they did this and these religious people from uh, Antioch and Iconium they persuaded the people persuaded the people now notice the people that wanted to worship them before they started talking to them and they started saying oh Paul and Barnabas very bad people started telling lies telling lies all of a sudden these pagan people that wanted to worship them before they changed their minds they changed their minds and then we are told that they stoned Paul Barnabas wasn't stoned well, because he wasn't the chief preacher. They felt if they got rid of Paul, Barnabas might not be able to do anything. So leave Barnabas alone. Didn't I tell you that the more you do, the more you are opposed? Even though Barnabas was also a man of God, they didn't stone him. And you know, it's a pity when the unbelievers are stoning Paul, if all the disciples will join them and begin to stone Paul as well. And you know, if unbelievers are stoning the pastor with words, criticism, condemnation, if the members of the church will join the unbelievers as well and stone the pastor, that is terrible. That is terrible. And so they stoned Paul. And they thought he was dead. He wasn't dead, but they thought he was dead. And they, they pulled him, you know, to the side. And then it says in verse 20, How be it? As the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. That's what we call persistence. He had not finished his job in that place. Now you Christian workers think about this. You have been beaten. Maybe you went to visit somebody and you were beaten mercilessly. And uh, you even forgot your Bible in that place while you were running away. And now the believers came around, the zonal leader, the area leaders, and some of the other house fellowship leaders. They took care of you, they prayed for you, they gave you food, now you're all right. And, uh, you know, if you are not a person having, you may have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You may have all that if you do not have the boldness, the wisdom, the power, the humility, the persistence. You'll say, please uh, help me find another house far away in town where these people will never see me again. You'll be afraid. And you know, I found some Christian workers like that. Even within the church, you know, you're in the choir. And it's a little problem. Oh, you say, I don't think I can stay in that choir again. There you are. You know, they don't have the real persistence that does the work of God until the end. Or sometimes you've got an usher. And uh, you know, there are some people, you know, some of these car owners, big, big men, who, you know, maybe they never go to, they've never gone to any other good church like this before. This is the first time they are coming to a large church like this. And whenever they don't have a place to park their car, they just, you know, forget every other thing and they're a little bit angry. And when they're angry, they make you to know that they're angry. And they talk to that usher. And that usher said, all this insult for being an usher, I will never be an usher anymore. There you are. There you are. 
the persistence is not there to have a smile on your face and say whatever the devil is doing wanting to get me out of this responsibility for the glory of god i am going to keep on doing it you know they stoned paul and he left him for dead they supposed he had been dead and then the disciples were around him and he got up and the very first place they went is that he went into the city and had taught many he even started teaching again preaching again doing the work again in that same place they returned again to lystra verse 20 and the next day they departed with barnabas to derby there was persistence and yet there was wisdom he didn't stay long there persistence yet wisdom and in verse 21 when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. You remember Iconium and Antioch? Where those Jews came from? To come and convince and persuade these people to stone Paul. That is the place he went again for his follow-up assignment. That man had persistence. He was committed to the work of God. Committed to the work of God. And if you are going to do anything for the service of the Lord, that must be there. Persistence persistence in other passages of scripture he told the number of things that he suffered for the glory of god in the work of the lord there was no self-pity in that apostle called paul and in your own life if you are going to work successfully for the lord that is one thing that must never be in your life self-pity Everybody is abusing me in town. And so what? They abuse Moses like that in town. You know, the people that, uh, you know, will never have insulted me before. People that respected me before. If you know they are talking about me now, when I be, since I became a Christian, since I became a Christian worker, you will be surprised the people that can open their mouth and talk against me. And so what? So did they talk about Jesus Christ. Uh, you know the people they will even uh, you know do havoc against me and they will even use uh, something physical to hurt me and so what so they did against paul the apostle and if jesus suffered why are you running away from suffering in any case they can kill you before you are ready to die you understand that they can't kill you before you are ready to die many times it's because you are not willing to leave. And you say, oh God, like uh, Elijah. Jezebel is after me. Take me away. I'm not better than any of my fathers. And God won't even allow that man to die, even though he wanted to die. But they can't kill you. The very ears of your head are numbered. Numbered. And you are of more value than the sparrows. God told Ezekiel, you just go after those people, those Israelites, even though they will fight against you and they'll be they'll do things against you but you'll be an overcomer he told the jeremiah the same thing and if you have studied the life of daniel in babylon oh difficult 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 time but they couldn't kill him even though they threw him into the lion's den and the shadrach meshach and abednego they couldn't kill those people you just depend upon the lord stay with the lord and the lord will see that you are protected in jesus name remember be wise don't say well the preacher has said he can't kill me before my time and when those people are sharpening their sword and they are loading their gun you go to the doorstep of their houses and say now come and shoot me i'm a christian i can die before my time well conduct your funeral service because that will be foolishness remember in the life of a man of god in the life of a person that is working for god wisdom is very very important you remember that elisha told the king of samaria while the king of syria assyria was after him that they are waiting for you that place don't go there that's the word of knowledge together with wisdom and he avoided death and danger from that place about uh, two or three times and so uh, we must depend upon the spirit of god and not just put ourselves in the very mouth of the lion the boldness the wisdom the power the humility the persistence now we're going to stop here today so we don't have indigestion 
Now, all that we have learned, in whatever we're doing for the Lord, whatever we're doing for the Lord, let's reconsecrate ourselves and say, Lord, whatever the trouble, whatever the difficulty, we're going to go on. Let there be humility in your life, but not humility that will fold your hand. Humility that will not pray for the sick. Humility that will not preach the gospel. Humility that will not do anything substantial, significant for the Lord. Let there be humility. Whenever something great has happened to other people through you, give all the glory to God. And then be persistent. Persecution may come, opposition may come, people may resist you, they may talk against you, they may slander you, they may tell lies against you. Just keep on, keep on keeping on. And the Lord will see you through. And on the last day, your reward will be great in heaven. Let's rise up and pray. Let's be humble. Let's be humble in our attitude, our thoughts about ourselves. Whenever something good has happened through us, let's know that we are planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God gave the increase. Humility. Never thinking of yourself to be anything apart from Christ. And if you have faced difficulties as a Christian worker, member of the choir, usher, as fellowship leader, don't run away because of that. Be persistent. Keep on in the work of the Lord. When people misunderstand you, keep on. When people oppose and slander you, keep on. When they insult you while you are doing the Christian work, keep on doing the work. If you suffer physically, emotionally, mentally, in whatever way, keep on on the work. Don't give up because of misunderstanding or slander or opposition or persecution.